Hi everyone, welcome to Friday Forecasting Talks. Now we will move to presentations of John and Aris. Before we do that, if you have any questions, we will take them at the end of the presentations and you will have two options how to do that. You can either raise your hand using Teams functionality and we will give you the spotlight or you can ask them in the chat and then I will ask John and Aris uh, after their presentation. Well, um, thank you all for coming. It's um, really great to see so many people have joined us on this uh, webinar, which is going to be conducted jointly by myself and uh, Aris. It's based upon a book that we published in summer 2021, and there's the title of the book, Intermittent Demand Forecasting, Context, Methods and Applications. We'll say a little bit more about the, the subheading in, in a moment, but maybe suffice it to say just by way of introduction that intermittent demand forecasting, as opposed to just uh, forecasting any intermittent series, has its main application in inventory management. And therefore we've taken that as the context in the book. So the early chapters and some of the material we're going to talk about today focuses on inventory, and then we'll move in to talking about forecasting. OK, I think that's enough just by way of general introduction. Um, looking at the, the people who've joined us, I can see that some of you will know us already. Can we go on to the next slide, please? Yes, I, as I say, I think um, some of you will know us already, but some of you certainly won't. So we'll just say very briefly a few words about ourselves. Um, I'll start off with myself. I'm at uh, Lancaster and I've been uh, here for eight years now and um, director of the Centre for Market Analytics and Forecasting, having taken over from Robert, Robert Files. Uh, also um, very involved in the Journal of the Art Society. And just what I mentioned about inventory, you'll see my interest there, having been president of the International Society for Inventory Research. And well, you probably know my interest in intermittent demand forecasting, but I'm also interested in other issues as well, and they're listed uh, on this slide. So I think that's enough about me. I'll then hand over to Aris to introduce himself. Thank you very much, John. Uh, can you see that OK? Uh, first of all, is that can you see the slides all right? Yes. Fantastic. OK, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, John. And thanks very much, Ivan, for the invitation, of course. Uh, I cannot see who is in the in the list of participants. Uh, I, I guess I will know some of you. For those of you that you don't know me, uh, my name is Aris Sintetos. I'm with Cardiff University, working with the uh, Logistics and Operations Management Department of Cardiff Business School, uh, where I am a director of um, a joint industry academia a research center. It's called the Park Institute of Manufacturing, Logistics and Inventory. We are looking very much at quantitative logistics or uh, manufacturing operations management in general. Uh, I am a co-editor for the major on mathematics. We are published by Oxford University Press for the Institute of Mathematics and its applications. And like John, I have been heavily involved over the years, uh, uh, both in the uh, International Society for Inventory Research. Currently, I'm chairing the inventory forecasting section, but also in the International Institute of Forecasters. John and I have been working with both institutes for a very long time. Uh, introducing the recessions and streams. Perhaps some of the stuff will come up a little bit later. Uh, in terms of my research series, obviously, intermittent demand forecasting has been a main interest of mine since the time I did my PhD with John back in the late 90s. I am still very much interested in the inventory forecast interface. And uh, over the last six, seven years, I would say, in particular, interested in forecasting in circular economy. This is forecasting of returns in closed loop uh, supply chains uh, informing a uh, uh, reverse logistics applications. Uh, right, again, uh, great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, let us make a start. Uh, I would like to, to show you a video that John and I prepared uh, with the help, obviously, with an external provider about our book. Uh, as John said in a, in a meeting we had a little bit earlier this morning, talk the presentation, this is shameless <laughs> a promotion of ourselves. Uh, I hope that the video is going to be uh, clear, though, and convey the message of what we are trying to do. Our book, Higher Level, discusses the relevance and importance of intermediate demand forecasting. We believe this is an area of exceptional importance uh, with very, uh, yeah, with serious uh, financial and environmental implications. And it presents the theory in the area, but also, as I mentioned before briefly, how we can actually operationalize things and hopefully make a difference in uh, real world applications. Thank you. Okay, so 
the subheading of the book is context, methods and application. So as I indicated right at the start, the, the context is inventory management. And if you look at any surveys on inventory investments, it soon becomes apparent just how huge they are and also what a high proportion of inventory is held in slow moving uh, items, particularly after sales items. And of course, these are the items which are at the greatest risk of obsolescence. And um, therefore, this is not just an issue of finance. Obviously, it is. We don't want to waste money. But equally, it's uh, it's an issue of environmental waste as well. We want to minimise the environmental waste of good, of particularly spare parts, but can be other things as well, which are made, they're shipped, they're stocked, eventually they're disposed of, and they're not used at all. So moving on to methods, and that'll be the main focus of today. As you might expect, we're going to focus on forecasting, of course. Um, this is, after all, Friday forecasting talk, and we'll talk about some different approaches. But another important issue is classification. And anybody who's ever worked with um, real life inventory systems will know that this is a big issue. How should we classify and of course, for what purpose? And finally, and this is quite a thorny issue um, for intermittent items. Actually, it's a thorny issue even for non intermittent items as well. It's been debated a lot, but it's a particularly thorny issue for intermittent items, which is how we should actually measure accuracy. How should we measure forecast accuracy? And of course, also, how should we assess the implication of those uh, accuracy measures? What effect does it actually have in the inventory context? Now, by applications, we're thinking now about these ideas that have been developed over the years, many of which have been tested quite extensively, uh, just are they available? Are they, are they actually out there and can people use them? And are there some gaps that we could perhaps highlight? So we'll, we'll come to that at the, um, at the end of the presentation. OK, so the other thing which you need to think about if you start from an inventory perspective is, well, what are the decisions that need to be made? The second one is absolutely obvious, and it's something that many, many authors have discussed. Uh, the whole question of how much should you buy when you're replenishing your stock? And that's obviously very important. But let me go back to the first bullet. There's, um, when it comes to slow moving items, there's a more fundamental question, which is actually, should we stock it at all? Um, if the demand reaches a certain point, should we basically say we won't replenish stock? If we sell more, that's fine, good to have sold it, but we're not going to replenish. We're just going to let it go down to zero, um, basically because the demand now is insufficient. And um, that's a, a sort of important question. And if you look in the literature, you'll find there's not that much written on this uh, important question. So I'll hand over to Aris to talk about the, the other aspects on this slide now. Yeah, sure. Thank you, John. Uh, it, it is interesting. We, we decide with John to uh, to include here relevant aspects, uh, uh, both things that we have covered in the book and things that we have not covered in the book. So although we have, uh, I mean, uh, the first chapters are really devoted to this relevant decision making in stock, not stock and replenishment, uh, we will explain just a little bit more in a few slides. Uh, there are also a couple of relevant issues uh, uh, which uh, we did not explore in the book. One is the issue of returns. Uh, I mentioned something briefly later on uh, earlier on about uh, my current research interest in the area of uh, circular economy, um, where obviously net demand becomes very important and uh, contemporary supply chains deal very much with reverse logistics. So we need to know what is coming back and we need to be able to estimate all that. Uh, also a very important problem, uh, which we did not explore in the book, is the problem of last I buy. Uh, what is happening when uh, original equipment manufacturers, they need to commit to a last time buy of some spare parts to support products that they are in operation. And that is a notoriously difficult problem, perhaps uh, or, uh, most likely many of you know. You need to commit to a decision over the next 5, 7, 10, 12 years, and you need to stock enough to be able to uh, satisfy contractual uh, requirements. Now, if you stock too much, obviously you end up with tremendous obsolescence or a waste. If you stock too little, you cannot meet those contractual agreements. And of course, there are penalties and so on and so forth. So it's a notoriously difficult problem. Uh, as it happens, both John and I, actually, we are working currently both on this uh, aspects of return, uh, return forecasting and last time by. Uh, as I said, these are issues that they are not currently discussed in the book. 
So uh, perhaps something of interest now here is the forecast, um, the, the quantities that need to be forecasted for the decision making of interest to us. So uh, when it comes to stock and non-stock, and John obviously mentioned something about that, this is a really crucial decision, uh, very much neglected both in the academic literature and very much also neglected sometimes in practice, although it can make all the difference. So for slow moving stock, are we going to actually commit to keeping that particular SKNU in stock or not? And as it happens, the whole thing comes down to uh, uh, accurately forecasting the mean demand. So the actual uh, algorithms, if I may say that, uh, that enable uh, uh, good decisions in this area, they come down only to forecasting uh, mean demand. Uh, so uh, this is a really nice area. Uh, we think that there is tremendous scope for improving real world practices. And there are some things discussed about that in the book. Uh, most of the of the main body of the book, though, is uh, is devoted to discussing replenishment. This is ongoing replenishment, period after period, how we can optimize the inventory quantities of interest. And to do that, we need to forecast two things now. This is not only one thing now, which is the mean. Now it's two things. It's the mean and variance of the demand. So in a little bit more technical terms, and when it comes to parametric approaches, what we try to do is to forecast the minimum, the mean, and the variance of some hypothesized uh, demand distribution. And we will talk a little bit about distributions later on, as we will also talk about an alternative approach, which is to empirically build up the distribution based on bootstrapping. I, <clears throat> back to the issues of that we did not discuss in, in the book about returns and last time buy. These are interesting problems when it comes to returns. Uh, what we need to forecast, it would be the net demand. Uh, so it would be the, the difference between demand and returns. So in uh, in closed loop supply chains, we need to forecast obviously what the demand is going to be, uh, but of equal importance is what is going to come back to us uh, to hopefully remanufacture or refurbish and bring in us to uh, as good as new state. So we have the demand coming in, we have returns that can be used to satisfy that demand. So uh, demand minus returns gives us the net demand and we need to forecast that somehow. Either we can approach it by forecasting the two constituent components separately or by forecasting net demand directly. And in the last time by, uh, the problem is uh, what is happening once uh, uh, that uh, the uh, once that we need to commit to this decision, there's going to be some sort of a decline in the incoming demand for the particular spare part. And uh, uh, the, 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 the challenge there is to forecast the rate of the demand decline. Uh, so I think that is important, although we do not treat these two particular aspects in the book, it's important to show that for different problems, there is something else that needs to be forecasting. That's what we're trying to say now here. Applications. OK, back to our applications. Please excuse. I mean, if that looks a little bit too involved, I, 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 I promise it's not. Uh, this is the sort of system that we employ uh, in order to uh, to show what is happening in, in, in our book. Uh, there is a, a long debate as to what is the most appropriate policy for dealing with intermittent demands. Is it continuous with the periodic applications? And we conclude, and with considerable input from people and from colleagues from industry, that the order up to level policy is the one that captures very well what is happening in practice. It is very simple. And in theoretical terms, it can also be characterized as near optimal. And this is what we do. So if you can have a look here, that describes uh, the actual evolution of things. We start with some stock. We call it stock on hand. Is the bolded line that drops down to a particular point. Now, it is the time interval that is going to trigger some replenishment here. So there isn't some sort of a minimum here. There isn't some sort of very ordered point or anything like that. It's a, it, the, the actual time, the particular time that elapses triggers uh, checking the system. So the stock on hand drops down to wherever it is there. And we decide to place an order to bring our inventory position back to some maximum. Now, for those of you that you have not spent time with inventory optimization, the inventory position will be what we have in stock, minus presumably what we uh, need to satisfy through back orders, plus whatever uh, it is pending to be received in the near future. Okay, so what we have, plus minus what we own, plus what is pending to be received in the near future. So this is the actual inventory position, and I'm going to place an order to bring my inventory position back to that order up to level that quantity is going to be received at some point in time and perhaps you can follow there the evolution of uh, stock. A couple of things to be noted here and to also an explanation as to why we decide to include this more involved, let's say, diagram. Uh, first, although this is really good for demonstration purposes, things in practice are a little bit more involved. The order up to level, it is not fixed. It is optimized in every 
different periods. So at the end of every month, let's say, if we are in the automotive industry, or at the end of every week, if we are operating in the wholesaling environment, or at the end of every half day, if we are, I don't know, in the retailing sector or a relevant retailing sector, uh, I'm going to optimize the order up to level. And how I'm going to do that? I'm going to do that with based on uh, the quantities that I discussed in the previous slide, which is the mean and variance of the demand and the hypothesized demand distribution. So every period, I'm going to update this order up to level. In every period, I'm going to check my current inventory position. I'm going to see what is the deficit. I'm going to raise the inventory position back to my order up to level, and I'm going to continue. One more important qualification. Uh, it is interesting that forecasting in this context is not only for one step ahead, obviously. Uh, I need to have uh, certain reassurances that things are going to go okay over what we call the protection interval. And in periodic applications, this protection interval is going to be the lead time plus the review period. So I need to have enough in stock to cover me over whatever is the lead time for the particular order to be received, plus whatever is my review interval. I gave some examples before. I don't know, in manufacturing, uh, it can be one month. In in, 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 in wholesaling, it can be one week. Uh, so uh, for reasons that I outlined before, this is the main policy we consider in the book. And this is really important for one very last reason, and then I'm going to move on. Uh, when we do evaluate, forecast accuracy implications when it comes to the point to evaluate not only forecast accuracy, but evaluating what are the implications of forecast accuracy for stock, which is the real thing. What is the actual trade off between inventory and service? And uh, we need to have an appropriate policy. Well, this order up to level policy seems to take quite many boxes. As I mentioned before, from a practical perspective, it is very common and it makes a lot of sense when it comes to intermittent demand. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip more details about that. But also from a theoretical perspective, it is very appealing. It makes a lot of sense, it has some very nice uh, uh, properties, if this is the right word, uh, to describe it as near optimal. Right. And with that, I'm going to hand over to John. I think you just skipped one slide there, Aris. Oh. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yep, that's it. OK, so when we think about performance, inventory performance, um, I suppose the first thing we think about is about the service that's being provided. Obviously, we also look at the amount of stock that's held as well. And one thing which is important to note is that we can actually evaluate these things at different levels. We can evaluate it in terms of the number of units but we could also look at it as an order line. So an order line might be for a particular uh, stock keeping unit, but for seven of them or for five of them or whatever it is. And of course we could look at whole orders as well. Much inventory theory is focusing at the unit level, but we do discuss in the book also about how order lines are important in some industries and how they can relate to the measures based on units. Now, the next question is, how do we think about um, service. There are there are three three measures you'll find in most textbooks: the cycle service level, which is basically the probability of not going out of stock; the fill rate, which is the proportion of the demand which is actually being fulfilled; and the ready rate, which will be the proportion of time when there is uh, when there are items on the shelf. Now, the most textbooks will focus on cycle service level, but Actually, fill rate is probably more realistic in many uh, practical applications. So that's maybe one we need to focus on a little bit more. Now, the next bit is really quite technical, so we're not going to go into detail here, but I just want to note something here, which is that when we start thinking about some of these measures, we have to be very careful when we say, yeah, but this is for intermittent demand. So to give an example here, let's suppose we say, what's the probability of not going out of stock? Well, if you have an item with zero demand, you're definitely not going to go out of stock, regardless of what you hold. So there are um, uh, some, some discussions that's been had and some proposals that have been made to look at um, amending these uh, standard measures uh, so that they will be appropriate for intermittent demand. So just a little note there. And another thing which people don't think about very often is we've talked about replenishment and obviously replenishment is very important. And we think of it as an operational decision, which of course it is. We have to decide at the end of every uh, review period um, how much we're going to order. But actually there's a strategic decision which is not considered so so thoroughly, and that is what should the service target actually be? So if we do go for fill rate, let's say, 
it might be traditional that an organization has gone for, let, let us say, a 94% fill rate target. Is that the right target? And what are the implications of that? Now, forecasting and more generally analytic modeling can be used here because we can do some what if modeling. This is a, a screenshot here from, um, from a package that's, uh, that's available and does this sort of thing. And you can actually evaluate for different um, targets what the implications of the stock will be, and that will help you to make a decision. And of course, in an organization, this is going to be a decision made at the higher levels of management rather than the lower. OK, so I'll just say a little bit about um, distributions. So if we're going to um, represent uncertainty, of course, we, we need to choose a distribution. You probably immediately realize that the normal distribution doesn't really fit very well for intermittent demand. So one question we should ask is, well, how should we decide? What should our criteria be? And we argue for four, four criteria. The first is obvious, really. It should fit the data well. That's clear. Also, it's quite nice if there's some a priori grounds. So there are good a priori grounds for thinking that the instance of demand would be Poisson, for example. But also, sometimes we want distributions which are going to be a bit more flexible, that can represent different shapes. Um, so, for example, the negative binomial is quite flexible. For faster demand, the gamma is quite flexible. And finally, as a, a practical issue, we want to be able to um, compute these distributions relatively quickly because we're going to have to do so for many, many items. OK, I'll hand over to you then, Aris. Oh, yes, sure, John. Um, so for intermittent demand, uh, we have devoted a couple of chapters actually discussing distributions. We thought it was very interesting and relevant and appropriate. Uh, two main things to consider here. One is that uh, uh, a distribution to describe the arrival, if you wish, of demand. Uh, obviously, there are two constituent elements here. One is the uh, the arrival of the demand, how often demand occurs, and then uh, the distribution of the demand when it does occur. So we have this uh, this compounding, let's say, of things, and that's why some of the compound distributions I will discuss in a little bit more details in a minute. They are very natural, back to this uh, a priori uh, uh, grounds for the choice of the distributions that uh, John referred to. So when it comes to the incidence and occurrence, there is a difference here. Uh, depending on the treatment of time, and we could distinguish between Poisson arrivals and Bernoulli. Uh, both, by the way, they have really good empirical evidence uh, in, in, in their support. Uh, things that become just a little bit more involved, and we start compounding that with demand size distributions. And I will give some natural candidates in a minute. Uh, one is the geometric, the other one is the logarithmic. As it happens, and back to the computational is, uh, compound Poisson distributions, they are far more easy to calculate and to compute than compound uh, Bernoulli distributions. In compound Bernoulli case, we end up with three parameter distributions, and that is a little bit involved. Uh, for compound uh, Poisson distributions, things are a bit more straightforward. There is considerable empirical evidence in their support, and yeah, they do make sense. Uh, let me give an example of some Uh, what we have done, this uh, goes, uh, and this is a summary table that we actually did use in the book. Is uh, uh, This goes back to some research we, we did, uh, is it more than 10 years ago now? And it was uh, with some colleagues uh, in, in the US, in France, and in the UK. Uh, we looked at the goodness of it of various uh, pl plausible candidates here across a, a great number of data sets. Uh, we present here only the data sets that we use for the final publication. It was a couple of papers that came up in the International Journal of Production Research. And we use, uh, by the way, some of those data sets, or excuse me, or all of those data sets are uh, available. And uh, uh, one important feature of the book is that we introduced a complementary website. Uh, where things that can be downloaded uh, to allow uh, replication and uh, why not reproducibility of things that they, got, that they are discussed in the book. So uh, we have a US defense uh, data set, a Royal Air Force, this particular data set has been used in very many studies and something from the electronics. <coughs> and you can see here the rather poor fit of the Poisson distribution is not flexible enough to accommodate what is happening. You can see the better fit of the stuttering Poisson and the negative binomial. Now, John did say something uh, there about flexibility. I would not like to go into too much detail unless, of course, any of you, you have any questions later on. Very happy to discuss that. Uh, but the stuttering Poisson and the negative binomial, they are very flexible. They allow the variance of the demand to be greater than the mean, which is a very, very uh, uh, good uh, thing to have. Uh, as it happens, the negative binomial can be even further flexible 
because it allows also the coefficient of variation of the demand sizes to take values above one. So there is some sort of an extra flexibility there. And this is reflected very much in the electronics data set, if you see at the bottom right, which was a particularly lumpy one. Now, the word lumpy here may need some qualification. I'm not sure about the audience. Again, I'm really sorry. I couldn't see who is attending. Lumpy data set is something that is not only intermittent, but is characterized by some sort of severe or extreme variability when it comes to demand sizes. So should that be the case? Negative binomial performs very well, as you can see on the bottom right, because it is built to do that. So it can accommodate extra variability in the demand sizes. Uh, just one more sort of technical note here. The whole thing has been done using uh, the KS, the Kolmogorov Smirnov test. There are some products uh, in the sense that the KS test uh, uh, has not been developed for discrete data, which is the data that we deal with here, but has been developed for continuous data and uh, can be actually quite conservative. Here comes the interesting nice qualification, though. There were some follow up studies to this initial study coming to confirm exactly the same findings. In fact, the actual percentage is reported in follow on studies conducted independently by others. They give the exact same numbers, and that was a really, really nice thing to, to, to see. So there is some evidence here that this of st standard distributions that are in the negative binomial, as John said, it is not particularly difficult to compute. They perform very well in practice. They can give really good outcomes when it comes to the cost of service uh, trade offs. When it comes now to how we can actually uh, 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 forecast, estimate the parameters of those distributions, as we mentioned before, there are two things that need to be estimated. One is the mean, and the other one is the variance. Let us make a start with the mean, uh, saying already as a qualification that the mean forecasting obviously has received quite a lot of attention, not only in the area of intermittent demand, but more generally. The issue of forecast uh, variance forecasting has not, uh, which is very interesting because obviously it's equally important and very much needed. So when it comes to forecasting mean demand, uh, for those of you with a little bit of background in the area, you will know all that. The exponential smoothing, which is a standard method, that very much uh, performs so well in, in demand forecasting in general because of all the known properties and so on and so forth, does not perform very well when it comes to intermittent demand because it suffers from a particular bias, which is called uh, is referred to as an issue point bias. So exponential smoothing is particularly high up, uh, straight after demand occurrence, and then the actual estimate then declines as you can imagine, because there are more zeros coming in until the point in time when another demand occurs again, and then the estimate goes up and continues to decline and so on and so forth. So if we are interested in the points in time where demand occurs, exponential smoothing is actually heavily biased. Croston came in, John Croston, and with whom also John and I had the pleasure to collaborate and publish also together. Uh, he introduced a method in 1972, goes back very many years, uh, that he corrected this thing, both uh, algorithmically, but also uh, uh, conceptually. He said, just a minute, this doesn't make sense. If demand is built from constituent elements, then surely we need to introduce what we now call size intervals methods. Let's treat those two elements separately. Let's try to forecast the mean demand. Let's try to forecast the interval of demand, and through that, hopefully accurately, the probability of demand occurrence. Let's combine the two things and let's have a forecast of the mean demand per period. And this is what he did. Uh, obviously, open up the, the avenue for 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 a, uh, for a lot of research coming up over the years, including also the things that John and I did. Uh, but as it happens, uh, his method uh, is biased, and he suffers from something that is called the inversion bias. Uh, without going to technicalities, we end up believing that the mean demand is higher than it is. And that has to do uh, really with the way that we treat the inter-demand intervals and how this is confused with the probability of demand occurrence. Uh, so John and I, we introduced a method. It uh, goes back many years now, in 2005. It was uh, published in the National General Forecasting. This term as SPA uh, as an acronym after our surnames. And that corrects for the Croston's bias. And we have been very pleased in the, uh, over, over, in the course of the years uh, over time to see that more and more empirical evidence accumulated to support its application in practice. And the method does perform well. An alternative here, something else that, again, is not necessarily very much discussed in the literature. We treat it to some extent in the book is the, uh, the, 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 the possibility of temporal aggregation. So when it comes to forecasting something over a particular protection interval, as we discussed before, over lead time plus review period, instead of uh, forecasting demand per period and then accumulating over a certain uh, interval that is uh, that, that is of interest, let's say, I don't know, three months. So we have monthly data and let's accumulate a forecast over three months. Why not introducing blocks, either overlapping or overlapping, and treating this aggregate series as a series of interest to us? And this is how temporal aggregation works. As it happens, something very interesting in intermittent demand, it can be characterized as a method self-improving mechanism. So when you have methods 
uh, like SPA, like Croston, and you actually temporarily aggregate performance, they seem to be doing really well. This is like a side uh, finding I, we thought it would be interesting to include. Right. How about the variance of demand? Well, as I said before, there is not that much. Obviously, I mean, there is some research, not as much as 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 the the amount of academic research devoted to forecasting mean demand. There are some possibilities here. I will summarize. I will I will refer to only two, which are the two classical ones. One is, or actually, the first one is the classical one is the variance of demand per period. I would like very much to focus the variance of demand. I'm going to do that through the variance of the forecast error per period, and I'm going to accumulate that over my protection interval. This is how standard applications work. This is software packages operate and so on and so forth. There was an alternative one proposed that goes back many years by Zori and myself. And the suggestion was actually quite intuitively appealing. Said if you are interested over the protection interval, why not looking at the forecast of the variance of the demand over that interval? So you build up the variance of the protection interval demand forecast error as opposed to the variance of the per period forecast error. Um, the latter approach has been found over the years, again, to have uh, quite a lot of empirical evidence in its support, as before has intuitive appeal. And also more recently, there are some theoretical studies that also provide some more theoretical also justification uh, in, to its importance. Right. Okay. Uh, and I'll hand over to John. Thank you. Thank you, Aris. So how do we measure accuracy then when we've got intermittent demand? So the first thing to say is beware. There are actually lots of traps here. So the obvious one is you can't divide by zero. So mean absolute percentage error, we can't calculate it because we've got zero actuals. So that doesn't work. But actually, no measures based on absolute errors are really appropriate here because um, there's a standard statistical result, which is that the mean absolute error is minimized at the median. So if you want to forecast mean demand, and more than 50% of your observations are zeros, then the problem is the optimal forecast, according to the minimum absolute error, is actually just to forecast zero. And that makes no sense whatsoever in terms of inventory. So we've got a lot of problems. We can't just take standard theory and apply it in this way. Now, there is one thing you can do, um, you could, instead of just looking at the absolute error, also look at bias measures as well. But that means you need to be looking at two measures in parallel. So in the next slide, we'll move on and just look at some alternatives. So there are some alternatives. We can look at things like, um, well, mean squared error is quite nice from a theoretical perspective here. But of course, we know it's got some problems, particularly with scale dependence. But we can look at scaled uh, mean squared error. We could also look at relative root mean squared errors of two different methods. They work quite well. Or we can simply look at the percentage best. And then again, we get rid of the scale problem. More generally, and this is a, uh, this is a more technical topic, but we do cover it in the book, is thinking about the accuracy of the distribution as a whole. This is something that a number of authors, including Tom Willemain, have argued for. I know Stefan Kalasso has also argued for it. And this is about trying to find ways to actually assess not just the point forecast, but the whole distribution and how accurately we're portraying that. And finally, and this goes back to the point we made right at the beginning of the uh, presentation, we need to measure not just how accurate the forecast is, but what effect that has in terms of inventory. And we've called that uh, accuracy implication metric. So we see in the diagram here, classic um, trade-off between uh, the on-hand inventory on the horizontal and one minus the fill rate on the vertical. And we've got three different forecast methods there in different colors. So we can actually put, uh, put, um, not just compare them in terms of their accuracy, but also compare them in terms of how well they perform in practice in an inventory system. And we can use a simulation to to do that. OK, I think I'll hand back to you, Aris, for the next slide. Thank you, John. Uh, yeah, so absolutely, this is uh, uh, important, obviously, to consider both uh, accuracy and accuracy implication metrics. Uh, if we consider only accuracy, though, things that can be quite, um, how can I say, simplified in a way. Uh, uh, obviously, when it comes to inventory implications, uh, we do need to simulate, as John mentioned. And, and going back to this more involved slide with the order up to level policy, we need to pick up a policy and we need to fit in the various forecasts and we need to simulate what would have happened 
if we were to use that particular forecasting methods with these particular for, uh, parameters. Uh, when it comes to forecast accuracy only, though, uh, there is a very interesting approach. It has been shown again over the years to work out really well. It's a two by two, <laughs> as sometimes is required for management decision making. Uh, it's a two by two. Uh, it is approximate. Uh, but it seems to be working out very well. It is very robust in various implementations. We have seen that and also other researchers that have found the same. Uh, this is, as I said, only considering forecast accuracy, but it facilitates the selection of particular methods. So if we were to have a suite of methods, let's say in theory, at least appropriate for intermediate demand, which one we should go for? So we could actually do some structural comparison between the two, leaving aside the details. The whole thing is based on mean square errors. So we can have bias properties, variance properties, and then have direct comparisons. And the outcome of those comparisons leads to this very nice four quadrant sort of approaches. Here I'm considering the SPA against exponential smoothing. And it tells us really when to use each method under a, a, a different values of the two main parameters here, which is what I have MI at the very top there, which is the average interdemand interval. I could have just written average interdemand interval. And what I have CVS square on the on the left hand side, I, again, I could have written a, a square coefficient of variation of the demand sizes. So we have already talked about that a little bit. There are two elements, the intermittence, how often demand arrives, and the variability of the demand sizes. So that particular uh, uh, diagram there can tell you which method to use under what circumstances. More importantly, though, or equally importantly, I should say, allows some very natural definition of the demand patterns. Again, over the years, some that we found with John, and of course, we have discussions with people in industry and in academia. There was this sort of uh, confusion as to what is what, what is erratic, what is lumpy, what is intermittent, what is clamped, what is this, what is that. So that particular diagram facilitates some sort of nice conceptual sort of uh, a, a classification of alternative demand patterns. Uh, and with that, I will hand over to John to talk about some empirical approaches. Yeah. So, so far we've talked about parametric methods, but there are also non-parametric methods available um, where we don't assume any particular distribution um, and where we basically resample from previous uh, observations. And that can be done either in direct blocks or it can be done by just sampling independently uh, from the previous observations. And um, this is pioneered by Tom Willemain and has been actually implemented in commercial software. Now, we need to know more about the relative performances of these methods, of the uh, more classical statistical methods and these methods. Um, there's been mixed results. In some studies, this has shown to be as good, uh, sometimes even better, but not always. So this is an alternative. The problem from a practical perspective, we'll say in the last slide, is that there aren't many opportunities to actually use this in practical software. Go into the next slide, please. Sure, John. OK, and this is just a very brief um, summary of where we were back in 2021 when we uh, released the book um, in terms of the things we've been talking about and whether they are available in proprietary software or open source software, and there's more of that becoming available now, or in-house software which would be prepared by uh, a software vendor. So wide, impl wide implementation is quite limited still, although there is some progress in this area. OK, I think that concludes our presentation and obviously we need to leave a bit of time for questions. So I think we can stop there, Ivan, and hand back over to you. Thanks, uh, Aris, and thanks, John. Uh, so currently we have one question and, and I encourage uh, all the participants to send your questions uh, in the chat or raise your hand if you want to ask something. I'll start with this one, and uh, if nothing happens, I have a couple of my <laughs> own questions. So the question is by Valeri, and he's asking, is machine learning covered in the book? And maybe I can actually expand on this and uh, to say, to add to this, uh, can you comment on the adv advancements in machine learning for intermittent demand? So any thoughts here? Do you want me to start, Harris? I mean, there has been some work on this area, but it's been quite limited. Uh, so when we when we published the book, we did include um, some 
uh, material on this. We didn't include it in this presentation, partly because of um, limitations of time, but also because it's still a relatively underdeveloped area and we wanted to summarise more the areas which have been better developed. But there has been some work, um, some work by our colleague Nikos Karens has looked at the application of neural networks, for example. The other, there's quite a number of potential applications uh, which haven't yet, I think, really been taken advantage of. We talked about classification, but could, there could be ML methods which would be appropriate there, for example. And we um, also mentioned at the beginning, the last time by, I'm actually working at the moment with a uh, knowledge transfer associate who is specifically looking at machine learning methods and for that application as well. Don't know, would you like to add anything, Eris, on that? Yeah. No, John, I mean, just maybe two things. Yeah, first, exactly what you said, maybe you could have mentioned that, and especially for this presentation, but certainly for the book, have tried to introduce things uh, for which some empirical <coughs> evidence has been collected, accumulated over the years for machine learning. As John said, there isn't much, or there is just, let's say, they are inconclusive. The other thing, of course, it is something very promising. Uh, at the moment, also, uh, when we talk about data-driven inventory control, you may get a skip the forecasting task and go directly to the to the determination of the, let's say, in the example I gave before, order up to levels, uh, by introducing that as a dependent variable. So machine learning can be directly applicable there. But then again, as John said, this is introduced in the last chapter of the book, uh, and hopefully, yeah, more 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 knowledge is going to be accumulated over the years. Yeah, Robert. Yeah, yeah. just a just a comment uh, that the. There are two studies of retail intermittent demand, both on Amazon data, which are pretty convincingly um, done, where the machine learning methods very much tailored um, to mm. the Amazon situation uh, uh, work well. And they're, they're studies, as I recall, which are well benchmarked. Mm. Well, I thank you, Robert. And of course, when the second edition of our book comes out, we shall be um, be sure to uh, to include that. Evidence, but yeah, <laughs> you're right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Can be, uh, can be found in the retail summary paper that uh, recently mm -hmm. published. Of course. Right. So uh, what, while we are waiting for further questions, I have one of my own. Um, Kostos Nikolopoulos uh, has been a proponent of intermittent demand forecasting and developing uh, models. And actually, in one of his uh, works and presentations, he said that we should pay more attention and develop more models for intermittent demand, because this is the essence of almost anything. On the other hand, there are some researchers, academics and practitioners that uh, have a position that you should avoid intermittent demand because it's a complicated matter. If you can avoid, just aggregate to a higher level and uh, solve the problem using other approaches. So what do you think? Is there a, uh, which of these approaches is the correct one or which one do you like? Well, go on, I'll start. I mean, the point is, if we can uh, aggregate up and get rid of intermittence, that's good. Of course, right? So if that's possible, absolutely, um, intermittence is something that you would want to avoid. But the problem is, it's not always avoidable. So I'm not sure I go quite as far as Costas in saying, you know, this is, if we can solve this, we can solve anything. I don't really, I don't really quite believe that. I just think it's an important application area, that's all. Yeah, also for the, oh, sorry, John, sorry. Please. Yeah, no, carry on, Oscar. Yeah, also for the for the aggregation. I mean, that comes with some qualifications in van. I mean, uh, <clears throat> uh, also temporal aggregation works out well, but different products have different lead times. So we are still interested in individual SKU forecasting. So the, uh, specifying the demand, the, the, the interval, the review period, let's say, for across SKUs, okay, uh, is there for a reason. So because so we can coordinate things with the same review period. So for different lead times, obviously for different SKUs, things with temporal aggregation can become a little bit more involved. Uh, uh, but back to what John said, yeah, if this is an opportunity, yeah, sure. I think that we need a little bit more evidence also there to see what, what exactly is going on, yeah. And uh, to be honest with you, back to the first part of the question, though, Ivan, I, I'm not really quite sure what, what was the question in terms of introducing more models or in terms of actually not treating intermittent demand. It was more uh, original idea of Kostas Nikolopoulos was that we should uh, pay more attention to intermittent demand and develop mm. more appropriate models there. So, 
Yeah, well, I think that but we, you wouldn't expect us to disagree with that. Yes. Um, I think that's absolutely fine. I was just saying that I don't think you uh, want to um, say it's the it's the answer to everything. That's all. OK, now we have several questions in the chat. So the first one from Giacomo, and he says that in the recent M5 competition, it seems that there is no specific standard intermittent as well for this retail data. Uh, do you have any reflections on that? OK, well, I've got one point I would like to make, which I think is a really crucial one. And that is when we did our early work, initially we were a little bit concerned that it's very difficult to get much improvement because of the whole nature of this type of uh, series. It's inherently difficult to forecast. All I would say about that is that, and I know other authors have started to really take this on board, um, we need to think not just about accuracy and can we get down to a certain level of accuracy we'd really like to get to, but the practical problem of what we do now produces certain outcomes, let's say, in inventory, it's stock and service. The real question is, can we do better? And if we can introduce methods that do better, then that is worthwhile, even though inherently you're probably never going to do exceptionally well in terms of, um, of accuracy. I don't know if you'd agree with that, Aris. Absolutely, John. Absolutely. I don't, I, I don't have anything else for totally okay. agree with you, yeah. OK, uh, related to the point of accuracy, there is a question from Stephen Van Eken. Uh, can we use forecast accuracy to review the effectiveness of the sales in organization? And uh, I'll, I'll shorten this question. Which other KPIs should be used in conjunction with forecast accuracy? OK, so this is about the link between the accuracy measure and the, the inventory performance. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I think. OK, so. so Yes, I do have some comments to make on that. I mean, an obvious comment to make is that if any method is introducing some bias, um, that can have quite a big effect in terms of the um, inventory performance, in fact. So we've only very briefly touched on this, but it's very helpful to not just um, use standard uh, absolute or other type of measures for, for accuracy, but also uh, to complement those by looking at bias. I think that would be my first point. Uh, Aris, anything to add? And what, what about other KPIs? Uh, anything specific uh, to recommend to look at? Well, I mean, sure, Ivan. I mean, over and above what we discussed here, it really depends on the actual setting. Uh, so, I mean, we have seen in inventory applications John discussed the trade off between um, inventory investment and a particular service achievement. It could be the inventory terms. It could be, you know, other other expressions mm -hmm. of the inventory oh. performance that may be of interest to the particular sort of organization. Uh, but as long as there is this clear linkage between forecasting and inventory, and as long as we try to understand that linkage, okay, I think uh, things are good. Yeah, because very often, I mean, this linkage is sort of forgotten there uh, and John mentioned something about bias very often for example I mean in industry I'm sure colleagues will appreciate that they will go to bias things expecting things to work out well and indeed uh, from a certain perspective if you look at inventories they do look a better I mean in terms of the services uh, and presumably though we are unnecessary inflated investment in inventories to achieve something like that so as long as there is a link as they try to understand it I think is really important yeah thanks Thank you. Uh, we have actually plenty of questions now. <laughs> I might <laughs> need to skip some of them. So Rodrigo is asking that uh, in the book you consider Inarma and Poisson processes, but what about hoax processes? And have you considered them for intermittent demand? Or for example, some other renewal processes, have you considered them? Okay, well, I can give a short answer to that. The answer to that is we haven't. And actually in the literature, there's, um, I, I don't know of any direct applications here to intermittence. So really the use of renewal processes and, um, and these sort of more statistically oriented methods is not that well developed. Um, we do mention in armor methods in the book and we do think they have some promise, but even there, and these are relatively simple, 
Um, actually, you're only getting some integer autoregressive order one. That's as much as we found empirically. So I don't know. It, it could be that looking at other renewal processes may be helpful, but um, I certainly haven't looked at it myself. OK. Uh, well, let, let me read. Uh, I'll skip one. Maybe we'll come back to that one. So th thanks, John and Aris. That's the point from John. Uh, I found the four quadrant method to be very helpful for categorizing my inventory range and simple to apply. The question is, I'm a fan of some of the open source development, especially mm -hmm. R from R Rob Heinemann. Do you anticipate industry moving towards using these kind of you know, advanced packages for inter intermittent demand forecasting at scale rather than just off the shelf software? Well, we hope so. I mean, there are now more um, packages and in our companion website, we do list them, by the way. Um, we didn't put it in the book because obviously it would be out of date almost as soon as we'd uh, put it in. Um, but yes, and the other thing we do discuss briefly in the book is there are also opportunities for proprietary software vendors to actually incorporate some of these methods themselves because a lot of the hard work has already been done. So yeah, it's a good point. I very much hope it'll it'll happen. Okay, uh, question from David Hoyle. If you are forecasting demand at the individual SKU level, are there situations and or methods where you need to take into account correlations between the demand levels of different SKUs? Wow, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, we haven't done it, and it is quite difficult when the data is very sparse, I have to say, to identify those um, uh, correlations. However, I mean, going back to the brief point I made about last time buys, um, work that Robin Goldsmith is doing at the moment um, at Lancaster is looking at the, the possibility of, it's not a direct correlation, but it's looking for common features of um, of series with intermittent demand and taking advantage of those common features in order to improve forecasting. And I think that's really quite promising. We, we okay. have discussed a few approaches in the book. Uh, I as mentioned for other uh, time series components. Uh, John has done a lot of work. I have contributed to some of that with myself on uh, seasonal forecasting. So, okay, faster items to pick up seasonal patterns, otherwise it would be really difficult either because of short histories or because of extremely variable demand series. And that seems to be working out well. So this is a really promising thing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, there is an, another um, interesting question uh, from Radek. Uh, due to incredible complexity of intermittent demand, you know, choosing right model, how to best measure it and so on. From commercial business point of view, would it be would it not be just easier to set minimum safety stock level at the specific quantity and then replenish whenever it drops below it and that's it just forget about all the forecasting part okay i mean yeah i i, I can i can see the i'm gonna say i can see the intuitive appeal of ending up with something very simple as that by the way Ivan, can you hear me because everything is frozen in my screen can you do okay yeah. You're breaking a little bit, but we can hear you. Maybe if you switch off the video, it will help. Okay, absolutely. Uh, is that better? So, sort of. Hello? Is, all right. I'm really sorry. Yep, yep. Everything is looks frozen. So yeah, although the intuitive appeal of going down the route of something, using something so crude as that, uh, yes, there is a difference. There is a big difference. Again, uh, I think I think my answer in short would be. Let's think of the problem across the entire stock base. Yes, uh, one single unit for a particular SKU is not going to make any difference. If that is to be gained through better forecast accuracy and some more intelligent, better informed inventory forecasting applications. So gaining, I don't know, or saving one unit in stock, yeah, it doesn't make a difference. But if you have that one unit in stock across an entire stock base, let's say of 75,000 products, yeah, it does make a difference. That would be my short reply to it. Okay. Right, we have one more question. It's a bit... Uh, so the, the question is uh, how to go about uh, intermittent demand forecasting in Pakistan, whatever mm -hmm. this means. And then I think the more interesting part of the question and more, more to focus the answer is uh, application of intermittent demand in healthcare. Have you encountered anything? Uh, is it actually a problem in healthcare? What do you, do you have from your perspective? 
Okay, so um, if I take the bit about Pakistan, my understanding is because of um, unpredictable lead times and so forth. Now, we do actually cover in the book um, some discussion of variable lead times. And so there has been work done on that and how we can incorporate variable lead times into our modeling. What I would say, though, about healthcare, I think it's a hugely important application area. It's not one I've worked in uh, myself, but I think there is a, there's a lot of scope to work in that area. Okay, right. Well, th that's it. We ran out of time. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for answering all the questions and thanks everyone for asking the questions. Um, so if you're interested, please uh, have a look at uh, the book of John and Aris. We will share the link one more time. Uh, thanks, John, for your presentation. Thanks, Aris, for your part of the presentation. And thanks everyone for coming. Thank you very much. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Ivan. Bye. Bye.